Fortress Canine Podcast. That was interesting. You need to silence yours. You were doing something on your end. It's mine. making mine go funky. All right, everybody. Sorry about that little glitch that there. Okay, it's wanting to start again. Silence oh. yours. Watch this. You were doing something on your end. It's there. Ha ha. I figured it out. I had a YouTube window open. So that would explain it. All right, everybody. Well, thank you for being here. Welcome to episode 154. I think it's 154 tonight of the protection dog podcast where we offer an alternative to conventional training methods and philosophy i am your host joel riles today is june 29th 2023 that means tomorrow is the midpoint of the year after tomorrow the half of 2023 will be gone what are you doing with your dash what's your dash you might ask your dash is that little line between the year you were born and the year you die on your tombstone. It's your whole life right there on that little dash. What are you doing with it? I hope you're doing something awesome. Tonight we are streaming on Facebook, YouTube, Twitch. It looks like Twitter is working for now. I think last week we had a, an issue, but didn't they post something about, we got to fix. Um, but it looks like it's working now. Uh, we are also on Rumble and on Instagram. So we are glad to have you guys here tonight. Ta tonight we are going to be talking about some breeding questions I've gotten. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about a question I got on doing bite work with your own dog. And, uh, and then the main topic for tonight is going to be balancing a protection dog in your life. And so we're going to go through and uh, talk about some of the things that you can um, kind of our philosophy on some of those things and things that will help you out if you're interested in getting or if you have a protection dog and keeping things balanced there. So I wanted to welcome everybody who is here. I know Pippin Eyes was already up on uh, the YouTube side. We've got Daniel and a couple other people coming in on the Instagram side. Those are the only ones I really can see uh, when I'm doing this. So I'm glad you guys are here. Also, welcome to anybody who's listening to this afterwards or who's listening to the podcast version. Uh, if you are listening to the podcast version and you would like to see the live stream on one of the live stream channels that you just heard me say we were on, uh, every Thursday night at 5 p.m. Eastern time, uh, we are on our live stream. So you can listen to that. If you listen to our podcast, um, the podcast episode is about a week behind. So when the podcast goes live, it's actually the one we did last Thursday. And uh, so if you'd like to be uh, the most up to date and hear the things as they're coming out, uh, come over, hop onto our live, send us questions, interact, uh, comment while we're talking, all that fun stuff. So what are we drinking tonight? Ooh, look at that. I got my cool glass back. I actually had it. We just don't always pull it out. So this was sent to me by one of my clients, Doug. And uh, he said it's his favorite whiskey and sent me a bottle. And I've got to say, it's pretty good. So this is Red Breast Single Pot Still Irish Whiskey. Uh, very nice. It is very smooth. Um, it has a, it's, it's probably a little smoother than the Jim Beam Black, uh, which is definitely more smooth than the regular Jim Beam. So uh, definitely if you are into whiskeys, I would give that a try. And uh, I've got one more I'm going to try and find before next week. Uh, that one of my clients had drank most of the bottle, but right before he was training with us last week and right before he left, he brought it over and we each were able to get a little uh, glass of it. And uh, that was a really good one too. So apparently um, I need to start getting into Irish whiskeys because all of my clients are sending me or bringing me Irish whiskeys to try and, uh, and they are really good. So, all right, let's go ahead and talk about today's sponsor. Today's sponsor is Fortress K9. Now we're going to be talking about some of the differences uh, between Fortress K9 and some of the other people that are out there training today. So I'm not going to spend too much time on it. But if you want a dog that's safe around your family, your friends, your other pets, and you want a dog that's ferocious and protecting you, then check out Fortress K9. So Fortress K9 is uh, available if you want more information on our website at FortressK9.com. That is F O R T. R-E-S-S, -S, the letter K, the number nine dot com. You can email me at Joel, J-O-E-L at Fortress K9.com. You can also send me a text. Remember, do not call me. I am too busy through the day 
uh, to take calls that, from numbers I don't know. So send me a text and we will set up a phone consult like I have with a potential client at 7 p.m. after we're done here tonight. And you can do that at 813-836-9244 or you can send me a message on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube. Although if you don't hear back from me on YouTube, please text me. I do try and keep up with the, um, the comments there. Uh, but that one's a little bit more difficult than the other two. Don't forget to sign up for our email list if you'd like the latest and greatest like updates on our puppies, which we're going to be talking a little bit about here in a minute. And um, if you are listening on podcast only, don't forget to check out the Fountain app at fountain.fm. I'm not going to spend too much time on that tonight either. One of the things I wanted to talk to you guys about, I'm getting a lot of questions. Um, you know, most of the people that listen to us for any length of time know that we do some crossings of our lines. Uh, but we did Stryker MDK, which is Malinois Dutch Shepherd Cross, although MDK herself is a cross. She is a uh, Malinois Dutch Shepherd Cross herself, so she's about 50-50, uh, but she shows Malinois. And um, so we've been getting some questions about it, like, you know, what are the strengths? What are the weaknesses? You know, what kind of things do you get when you do these crosses? And you guys hear me say things like uh, Dutch Malinois Cross is one of my favorite crosses, right? And so I get people asking me, like, like why, what's the deal, what's up with this? And so I wanted to explain something called hybrid vigor to you. Who do we have? Is this, this is little pink girl. Oh, so this is one of our little females that shows Mally. So there's two little females that show Mally in the litter and the others are all brindle or very, very dark, almost black. Hey, sweetheart, how you doing? Yeah, yeah, she's a sweetheart. And uh, so what you get when you uh, cross two breeds, um, especially if there's a significant amount of uh, lineage in the breeds, right, is you get a thing called hybrid vigor. And uh, so I actually use Chet GPT to do a little research for me, be my research assistant tonight. Oh, 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 are you snuggling? Are you getting up under my beard? And, uh, and so I just wanted to read this to you. And uh, so I'll, I'll try and read it with some inflection so it's not too boring. Hybrid vigor, also known as heterosis, refers to the phenomenon where offspring from a crossbreed of two genetically diverse parents, meaning the, the two parents have diversity from one another, right? They exhibit improved traits and characteristics compared to their purebred counterparts. It's the opposite of inbreeding depression. So if you guys are familiar with uh, the German Shepherd and you see things like their sloped back or a lot of people that are interested in our German Shepherds ask, do they have hip dysplasia? Do they have elbow problems? Do they have the hip problems and the heart problems and the eye problems and all the things that uh, German Shepherds are known for, right? The reason German Shepherds are known for those things now, they, they weren't in the 40s when uh, Germany was still very, very closely uh, controlling their, their breeding and practices and all that kind of stuff, is they've been inbred too long, right? Because the AKC says in order to get a German Shepherd, you have to breed a German Shepherd to a German Shepherd. Uh, well, that's not the old breeding practices. And when you do that kind of breeding practice, you get a thing called inbreeding depression. And that occurs when two closely related individuals are bred. So that leads to a reduced genetic diversity and potential health and performance issues in the offspring. But when two different breeds or lines are crossed, the resulting hybrid offspring offer uh, often display increased vitality, vigor, and overall fitness. This is because... The combination of genetic materials from the two parent breeds introduce new and complementary gene variants. And uh, this can enhance various traits such as growth rate, disease resistance, fertility, temperament, and overall performance. The improved traits observed in hybrids are the result of several factors. The first is offspring inherit a greater number of diverse alleles, which are part of the genetic code which are alternative forms of genes, and it increases the overall genetic variation. So one of the things we like to look for in our litters is when I breed a Malinois and a Dutch Shepherd together, I want to see Malinois and Dutch Shepherd. I want to see diversity in the litter, right? That shows me that the genetics are not getting too close. Now, if I breed a Dutch Shepherd and a Dutch Shepherd, I'm probably going to get mostly Dutch Shepherds, right? But even then, occasionally, like my last Dutch Shepherd breeding, I got one Mally female out of it, which I'm keeping. And um, because there is diversity in our lines, right? And we want to keep that diversity in our lines because overall, that as long as all of the diversity you have fits within the good category, right? Good genetic diversity. Then as you do these crosses every couple generations, 
it you get this thing we're talking about this hybrid vigor right so this increased genetic diversity can lead to a more robust immune system better adaptation to environmental challenges and improved overall health and this is what we see over and over and over again uh, in our generations the second thing that happens is the interaction between genes from different parent breeds can create synergistic effects that enhance specific breeds so this phenomenon uh, is known as gene interaction or gene complementation, and it can result in traits that surpass those found in the parent breeds individually. For example, if one breed excels in speed and another excels in endurance, their hybrid offspring may exhibit exceptional athletic performance in combining both. They may have excessive speed and endurance because they're getting the best from both parents, right? And it's due to a combination of these traits. Even when they don't get both of those great traits together, the endurance or the speed tend to be elevated, right? So even if they don't get the combination of those two things, the speed tends to be faster than the speed of the parent or the endurance tends to be longer than the endurance of the parent, right? And so this is what we're talking about when we talk about hybrid vigor. And I thought it would be at least worth mentioning uh, when you look at people who are doing crosses, now it does definitely take an eye so that you're not putting bad traits together, right? You want to be putting traits that like they were talking about that complement one another together. And that's what we've been doing for over 12 years here uh, and continuing a breeding program that's over 80 years old that started in Germany. But that is what hybrid vigor is. And so if you're interested in, we have two slots left, I think on our uh, Dutch Shepherd Malinois litter would be definitely worth you checking out. And uh, I am super excited about this. So we are keeping three or four from the litter. Um, I think we're keeping four, but one's already been reserved for a protection dog. So um, yeah, they're, they're an amazing litter and I am super excited about them. All right, what is new on the dog stead? Well, I've just been cleaning and doing some other stuff. I'll have a video up about one of the things we're doing for our raised beds uh, probably this week or next week. But I wanted to show you guys some of our new products. So these are on the website. Do you know what these are selling for on the website? I think I have them as 50 or $55. So I wanted to put this up and show you guys. This is our gray and it has like a black, uh, that's a laser cut, laser engraving on it. Looks pretty awesome. It's got kind of a gloss to it. And um, so the first person who contacts me wanting this lighter, we will do for $45. So that's $10 off the normal price. So if you guys are interested in getting that, it's up on the website right now. Don't go there and buy it. Send me a message, either uh, Instagram, DM, or a text at 813-836-9244. The first person I hear from on that, I will sell them that lighter for $10 off our normal price. So if you're interested in that one, let me know. The other thing is, I showed these a little bit last week, but I wanted to bring them back up. So this is the original design we've been doing. This is the run your dog, not your mouth design. And, uh, and so we've gotten another set of prints for that. And they're available in the black and the green. But one of the things that we've added is if you notice on this one, let me pull this up again real quick. If you notice on this one, the writing on it is slightly distressed. Like you can see the U on the run. Let's see if I can figure out which finger I'm supposed to be looking at right there, the U. Um, that's like a distressed writing. It looks kind of cool, but what we discovered is the distressed stuff um, doesn't lock on quite as good as the solid lines. So we edited that design and the only thing that changed is solid lines. So we don't have anything distressed. The flag was distressed on the arm and the words were distressed on the back. And so we made those just straight so that they stick on when it's like straight line, like the uh, logo on my chest right here. Um, they stay on real good. They don't peel off in washings and stuff like that at all. And uh, so the other one that I showed you guys last week is F-A-F-O, you're off my tourniquet list. I love this design. That's Ratchet, by the way, my original dog. My daughter, my 16-year-old daughter did that design for me based on a fuzzy photo that I sent her. And I said, can you turn this into a black and white drawing, uh, like an ink drawing? And sure enough, she did it. And then all of our shirts now have this handsome guy on the sleeve. My wife said, you need to put an image of you on there. And I'm like, I don't know how to put an image of me on there. And so we started talking and she's like, well, why don't you try clip art? So I was like, all right, I just searched beard and then I searched cowboy hat and then I searched sunglasses. And she's like, oh, you got to have a cigar in it because you're always smoking cigars on your videos. So I, I, was, I was like, they're not going to have cigar 
uh, clip art in here. But I searched cigar, and sure enough, two of them popped up. So that was the one we picked. And then I overlaid them all in Photoshop and put them together as a single uh, image. And that's our new little uh, apparel logo uh, that we're putting on our stuff. So if you're interested in our shirts, those are available on the uh, website, or you can just text me and we will get you hooked up. Uh, we have lots of sizes and uh, we do have a few variations in colors. The green and the black are our primaries, uh, but we do pick up uh, when we find deals on shirts, uh, various different colors and sizes. So if you have something and you're like, hey, do you happen to have this? Send me a message. We'll see what we got. And if we can uh, hook you up, we will. All right. Don't forget, I will be speaking at Prepper Camp September 22nd through the 24th. That's in Saluda, North Carolina. Uh, as far as I know, that's really close to the South Carolina border. Every time we leave there, we're in South Carolina pretty quick. And uh, you can find out more information at PrepperCamp.com. And then we will be at Self-Reliance Festival in Camden, Tennessee on October 14th through the 15th. And I'm actually going to be speaking on uh, starting a niche business there. But of course, we don't go to any of our events without bringing our dogs with us and letting them bite people because what's cooler than dogs biting people? Of course, you know, they're all volunteers and they're in a bite suit. If you would like to be a volunteer, you can do that at selfreliancefestival.com. Uh, John allows us to put people in the bite suit and deploy our dogs on them. Uh, if you come to prepper camp, it's just going to be me in the suit. Uh, there's uh, the liability thing. They don't want us letting other people get in the bite suit. But you'll get to see my wife let out her marital frustrations on her husband by deploying one or more dogs on me uh, wearing the bite suit at those two. So check those out at PrepperCamp.com. Uh, that's September 22nd through the 24th in Saluda, North Carolina, and Self-Reliance Festival, October 14th and 15th in Camden, Tennessee. All right, so here was a question I got. Uh, I actually got this a couple weeks ago. I kept men meaning to bring it up and then I would forget. So I put it on my outline last week right after I ended the podcast and was like, dang it, I forgot to put it on again. Uh, so I didn't forget it this week. So Danny asked, can I do bite work on my own dog? Uh, there's no protection training schools or trainers near me and it's a multiple hour drive to the nearest trainer. Can we teach the fundamentals of bite and protection work? So what I'm actually going to do, give me just one second. I'm going to do a copy of next week's episode and we're going to put in, um, doo -doo 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 -doo. I'm going to label this starting protection work with your dogs. So I'm going to go into this in a lot more detail um, in two weeks. But I wanted to address it now. And so, okay, so there's a couple of things to keep in mind. Um, number one, if you want to start the fundamentals of protection work with your dog, there's numerous things you can do there that you don't need to do bite work for specifically, right? So think of it as you, you have kind of two categories when you're dealing with um, a protection dog. And it's the same two categories that we have as people when you're thinking about, um, hey, I know how to shoot a gun. I can come to this place like a range and I can take my gun out of the box and I can load it and I can point it down the range and I can pull the trigger and it goes boom and I can hit the target. Yay, I can do that thing, right? So think of bite work as the mechanical action that we would use as such as firing a weapon, right? Is, you know, you, you know how to hold it, you know how to pull the trigger, you know how to load it, you know how to function it and you know how to aim it and actually hit the target, okay? That's kind of what bite work is. But if that's all you can do, that doesn't mean that you can defend yourself. That doesn't mean that you can clear a house, right? If you come home and your front door is open and you need to go in and check your house, if you've not cleared a house or if you don't have the mentality to protect yourself, then just knowing the thing that maybe right? It's better to know it than to not know it. It's better to know how to shoot your gun and hit a target than to not know how to shoot a gun and hit a target, especially if you are planning to have a gun and potentially use it to defend yourself. But there's a lot more that goes into defending yourself than just knowing how to pull the trigger and hit a target, right? You have to have a certain mentality. There's a certain mentality that goes into defending yourself. My mentor used to say 100% aggression, zero anger. And that takes a lot of training and stress inoculation to get to where you can bring forth 100% aggression, zero anger. That's a very difficult thing to train yourself to do. There's also things like other skill sets that complement that, right? And so when you talk about potentially doing the fundamentals of bite and protection work yourself, um, 
then you can do a lot of things with your dogs that will increase their capability to protect you without necessarily doing bite work. So some of those things are, uh, we call it building suspicion. So one of the things I do with my dogs, and I used to do this a lot, since we do a lot more bite work, we, we do it in a different way now. But when I was living in neighborhoods and stuff like that, uh, if the neighbor was out and I walked out on my front porch, for instance, or I was out working in my garage or whatever, and somebody came out in the yard, I would I'd grab my dog's lead and I'd go, who is that? What are they doing over there? What are they doing, girl? Keep an eye on them. And when they would like lock in on the what I was looking at, and they'd start paying attention to it. They put their ears forward and they're like, whoa, what are they doing? I'd be like, good alert, good alert, keep an eye on them. If they'd bark, I'd be like, all right, all right, yeah, that's good. But ease it up, like, let's leave it alone. But let's keep an eye on them. And so we would, I'd talk to the dog in that vocal and I'd pay attention to them and we'd focus on them for like 30 seconds, maybe a minute. And then I'd go, all right, I think they're okay. Let's leave them alone. All right, we're good. Let's leave them alone. Come on back and do this other thing, right? Get on your box and lay down or whatever that I was doing with the dogs. And, um, and so I would use those opportunities to create suspicion in the dogs, right? Another thing that you can start training your dog to do, and we'll mention this um, later on in the episode as well, we'll go into a little bit more detail, is you can start doing various different drills and just incorporate them into your life. Like if you think, hey, one day I might want my dog to clear my house for me, you have to teach your dog to clear your house. And so the first thing you want to do is what pattern are you going to use to clear your house? Um, you may want to have a pattern from the front door, a pattern from the back door, or maybe a pattern from the garage door, right? Depending on how many entrances you have to your house. And so what you can start doing is you can start teaching your dogs these patterns and having them look for people. You can even have them look for like your kids, right? And now they're obviously not going to be aggressive when they find your kids, but it'll be like, woo, you found me, right? And, uh, and so they'll know I'm actually looking for a person when I'm doing this. So you can tell the kids, hey, go inside and hide under a bed. Just pick a bedroom and hide under a bed or go inside and hide in a closet or hide in a bathroom, right? And have them just go hide in a place. And then you start off with your dog on a lead and you go, hey, hey, let's check the house. Let's check it. Is there somebody in there? Now, if it's your kid, don't get all like suspicious like I was getting earlier when we were doing the neighbors, right? Make that more like a, a fun kind of a thing, but you're still following the same pattern. You're following the search pattern to go through and search the house. And when you're developing your search pattern, you want to have somewhat of a tactical mentality in this, right? If I walk into my house and I'm in a living room and it's an open floor plan, and then there's a hallway with all the bedrooms, the first place I want to search probably is this open floor plan area. And then I want to move from there down the hallway and through the bedrooms. And, uh, and there's multiple reasons. We're not going to get into all the tactics of that, but Think about doing things like that and starting to develop those capabilities in your dogs uh, in terms of fundamentals of protection work. OK, and then the last part of it, there's other a lot of other little very nuanced things. And, and we'll try and get into that more uh, in a couple of weeks. But the last part of it is the actual bite work itself. Now, there's a couple of things that you can do. What I would probably recommend, and one of my clients was just here talking to me about it. He, he bought one of our puppies. He did a pretty good foundation in the puppy. And, uh, and then we brought the puppy out in bite work while they were there for uh, here with us for about a week. And, uh, and he's like, okay, how can I continue this? Right. And he's thinking it's probably going to be hard to get any of my buddies to agree to actually get bit. But what I can do is I can buy a muzzle that fits her and I could probably get them to hide in the house. And then when she finds them, that I can actually put her on watch and then they can like, she can hit them with the muzzle and they can actually do like a little muzzle tussle. And, um, and then I can be like, you know, get out of my house and like follow whatever uh, process you want to follow for, for protecting your house. Right. And so you can do that. You can put a muzzle on your dog and you can start getting them used to coming up and hitting. Now, if you do this, you're going to get bruised where they hit you. Because if you're doing an agitation muzzle, which is what you need, right? Don't get these cheap little muzzles. The agitation muzzles run, in the hundred to two hundred dollar range, okay. And uh, so you want to have a good, solid agitation muzzle. My favorite muzzles are made by Recon Canine. R E C O N letter K number nine dot com is their website. Recon Canine. Uh, they uh, do vests and and equipment for the special operations community. Uh, so their stuff is a little pricey. I think their muzzles run in the one hundred and sixty range. And uh, and you check out the like. There's a sizing. Uh, way that you measure for the sizing and they have a small, medium and large 
uh, muzzles. My favorite muzzle, I have the small and the medium because my dogs tend to be a little bit on the smaller side. And my bigger dogs, I use the Elite Canine and Ray Allen um, call it, uh, muzzles for. So, um, but on the front of a muzzle, an ag agitation muzzle is this steel bar. It's not very thick, but it's like the the um, recon canine is flat. It comes straight down, and then underneath the uh, standard type muzzles typically come above the snout, down the snout, in front of the snout, and then under the snout. And when a dog, it takes them a couple times to figure out how to use a muzzle. But once they figure out how to use their muzzle, they will use it as a weapon, and they will rear their head back and they will punch you with it. And that steel plate, that hurts, right? So you want to protect your face and the back of your head because I've seen guys get knocked out, getting hit in the back of the head with a muzzle. And uh, so if you do go to the ground and you're, and you're kind of wrestling with the dog on the ground with it, number one, don't ever grab the muzzle. If you grab the muzzle, it's a possibility you'll pull the muzzle off, right? So I'm not grabbing a hold of their muzzle, but I might grab a hold of the dog and do various different things, right? Now keep in mind, we're teaching and training the dog to learn how to fight. So we're not just going to take advantage of the fact that the dog has a muzzle on and kick the crap out of it. We're, we're going to be uh, letting it just do its its thing the first couple of times to get used to the muzzle. And then we're going to be slowly like, oh, this is a little weakness. Let me show you this weakness now. Figure out how to counter this weakness. Right. One of the things I'll, I'll do when we get a dog fairly advanced to muzzle work is I'll actually start using their collars against them. And I'll grab their collars and I'll throw the dog by their collars and, and pretty quickly they learn, you reach down and try and grab a hold of my collars. I'm not letting you get a hold of my collars because they realize my collars are a weakness for me, right? I've got to keep you away from my collars while I also fight. And, um, and so muzzles are a great way to introduce some of that stuff. But um, I recommend doing something on your forearms where they're primarily going to be focused. And, but when they hit, you have, remember, they're biting if they don't have that muzzle on, right? So when they hit, I'm pretending like I got bit ah, and then like, I'll come back in and fight. And then they hit the other arm and ah, and I'll, I'll keep like fighting with them. But every time they hit, that's like a bite. And, and you've got to give them like the reward of the bite. And then if you do have, ideally you would have friends or, or, you know, people who are willing to work with you locally uh, that you could do bite work with. If you do start to do bite work, there's a couple things. Number one is the biggest thing you have to teach a dog who, who doesn't bite a lot is they have to build up their ability to deal with torque on their canines. The canines are longer. When they bite into something, their canines are the primary teeth that are holding grip on that. And then as they thrash or pull or, or do their bite work, there's a lot of torque on those canines. And if they're not used to it, then it's something that they have to build up to, right? So one of the benefits of some of the tug type stuff is you can do some of that, build up that torque on those canines work by doing tugs with them. And you can do, you know, rags or towels. You can do leather tugs. You can do the bite work type tugs. And you can do tug work. And so now you're teaching the dog to bite a thing. You're you're building up the uh, capability of their canines to deal with torque. And you're doing muzzle work with the dogs. And so when they do bite, they're ready to do it, right? That would be my primary recommendation is have uh, some friends or family that will uh, help you uh, teach your dog various different scenarios and situations with the muzzle, do tugs with your dog, and then build suspicion and develop your search techniques and things like that so that uh, you're you're prepared as much as you can be without doing the full 100% scenario with the bite suits when you're going through things. And um, so, so hopefully that answers your question, Danny. If there's any other questions that arise from that, feel free to send me another message on Instagram and I will try and get back much quicker. Uh, I intended to answer that like three or four weeks ago and uh, I didn't put it in my actual outline. So I am, I apologize for that. All right. So with that, let's jump into tonight's topic, balancing act, how to balance protection training with everyday life. Okay. So at Fortress K9, you've probably heard me use the word stability uh, if you've been listening for any length of time, we talk about stability a lot. So first let's define what stability is. So stability is your dog is not permitted to be aggressive or to bite anything unless one of two things are, are met. Unless I tell you to, or I'm being physically attacked. Those are the only two times that you can show aggression. Okay. And so we refer to that as stability. 
So we'll do what we call stability drills with our dogs. And what we do when we do our stability drills is um, after we've kind of built up the confidence of the dog a little bit and they're biting good and they're, they're doing a good job, uh, we don't do this early on, super early, because we want to make sure we don't set the confidence back with the dog, right? So once the confidence is up pretty decent, then we start building in stability drills. And so the handler will tell the dog, uh, hey, foos up, which is coming to my side. Seats, sit at my side. Leave it alone. It's okay. And I start off pretty relaxed. I have the I have the bite sleeves or a jacket on. And I just come up and I just kind of touch the dog. So they see what normally triggers them to start biting, right? They see the equipment. And I walk up and I just pet them. Now, if they bite it, their handler corrects them. Fooey that. I said, leave it. Foos up. Seats. Sometimes they get a little stressed. They want to move out of position, right? We, we treat that as an obedience correction, not a aggression correction. So no, I told you to sit at my side, get back to your place, seats, leave it alone. It's okay. Relax. And so we'll talk to the dogs in this like very reassuring tone. And then as the dog gets more and more confident in its stability, I will agitate more and more aggressively, but I don't attack the handler because if I attack the handler, the dog can bite, right? And if I do touch the dog, it's like lightly. It's like, you know, there's just like, you know, like little bumps on the shoulder, little bumps on the hips. And then I kind of bump them a couple of times and then I go, oh, good job. And I pet their head, but with the bite sleeves on, right? The bite equipment. And pretty soon the dogs realize, oh, when my person tells me leave it, he's going to irritate me for a few minutes and then he's going to pet on me. And this is great. And, uh, and so they're just waiting for it. There's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do your thing. All right, now pet me. Oh yeah, this is so fun. Right. And so we'll build that in and then we'll do various different types of stability exercises. Like we'll put the dogs on tables and we'll have other dogs walk over top of them. Right. And in that situation, the dogs always just have to leave every other dog alone. So when you're walking over dogs, leave them alone. Just step over them and go where your handler tells you to go. When you're laying on the table and other dogs are walking over you, leave them alone. Right. When we're walking around, a lot of our walking drills, we have um, people are walking around each other, right? Handlers and dogs all walking together around each other. And, uh, and so it's leave it, you know, don't mess with this other person, blah, blah, blah. And we do a lot of drills like that. We'll put the dogs in positions and we'll have other handlers walk up to them, step over them, pet them, touch them, different things like this. Right. And all of those are different versions of stability exercises in the dogs so that they learn. I only use aggression in my teeth when my person tells me to, or someone attacks my person. In those two situations, I bite. Other than that, no biting, right? So that's what stability is. And no matter who you get a protection dog from, and no matter what they call it, right? Not everybody's gonna call it the same thing, but whatever they call it, make sure that you're getting a dog that has been trained for stability, okay? Um, there, we, I just watched a video today. One of my wife's friends sent it to her and it was the, uh, a bunch of police officers and it was all the police cams, the, the dash cams and the body cams. And they were chasing this guy, right? And they're chasing him on the interstate. And it was here in Florida, you know, probably one of those Florida man things. And, uh, so they're chasing him down the interstate. He like goes through the median, turns around, goes the other way. They chase him back the other way. He has an accident, it crashes. He jumps out of his vehicle. He runs off. Um, you know, there's officers driving into officers. It was like, it was a really, really, it was a shit show, right? The officers were terrible. Uh, the, everything they did was pretty much screwed up. But anyway, so one of the cameras, the guy, like he, first of all, he runs into the back of another police car and then he backs up and then he like starts driving through the grass. Cause the guy got out of the car and ran away. And so he's driving, chasing this guy. And then he like gets really close to him and he jumps out of his car and he goes to run after the guy and a canine officer behind him deployed a canine to go after the guy and the canine bites the officer. Um, and so there's a million reasons why that happens. And it's almost all the police officers training's fault, the canine training department's fault. And so that happens. And then they finally catch the guy and they tackle him to the ground. And then there's this dog still running loose because the handler doesn't have any control over him. The dog runs in and bites the guy after they have him basically down and, and in handcuffs. Right. So I'm like, that dude needs to sue that police department and get a million dollars because that's obviously excessive force and failure to train your dog to do its job. Because once a guy is down 
and subdued under police officers, there's, in my opinion, no excuse to deploy a dog on them, right? And the dog already in the same video demonstrated that it's unstable because it bit a fellow police officer. And you see him like, ah, his hand, like he gets hit and he kind of gets knocked out of camera. And then, and then another car comes up and they, so they switch the cameras to the second car that pulls up. And you see he gets like full on bit in the hand uh, by this dog. And of course, thankfully for him, it's a bite and hold dog. So it doesn't like thrash his hand to pieces, but it's like, it's like biting his hand and he's like, ah, and the handler runs up and grabs it off. Anyway, that's an example of an unstable dog, right? Nobody wants a dog that behaves that way. Nobody wants a protection dog that, that is indiscriminate and who it bites. It's running around just smashing things. And, and then, oh, by the way, that same dog, when they tried to deploy it on the guy, it ran right past the, the actual bad guy, right? It didn't bite him until the officers tackled it to the ground, tackled the guy to the ground, and then it ran in and bit him, right? So it, it was just this complete shit show. So all of that to say, what are some things we can do to integrate some strategies into our regular life that incorporate protection training exercises and start making them part of their normal routines, right? So we, we already talked about checking your house, and that's a great exercise to do. It literally, so what I would do is I would start off just checking like the main entry point. So whatever the main, excuse them all, whatever the main entry point is, like if you walk in and you're in your living room and it's an open floor plan kind of an area. So a lot of these, there's like a, a loop, right? And there's like the living room, dining room, kitchen. And you can pretty much like walk a circle around them. Just start searching that. And, and like, if you've got some closets in there or whatever, places where a person could actually hide, have them check them and just start going around. Check. Good check. When they, when they come over and like show a little interest in that spot, good check, check over here. Good check. Check over here. Good check. That doing a, a area that size would take 30 seconds to a minute at most. Right. And so you can start, um, you know, a couple times a week when you come home, grab your dog, check that area. And then move them into the rooms and start make sure when you move into a room, you check, is there a bathroom? Check behind the shower curtain, right? Check under a bed, check in a closet, at least check the closet. You don't, the dog doesn't have to open the closet, but they should sniff and check, right? And see, is, is there somebody in that closet? No, okay, no, there's nobody in that closet. Let's move on, right? And then when you start having like your children or other people hide in those things, they should be able to detect, is there a person in that closet, right? And so that's one of the things one of the like daily routines or a couple times a week routines that you can start integrating in. Another one is when you drive around with your vehicle, with your dog in your vehicle, wherever you're going, and I recommend you do this more frequently than not, is start introducing your dog to watching over the vehicle. So for instance, if you're pumping gas with your dog, right? You're in your car or you're sitting outside your car. If your dog is in your vehicle, and all your windows are rolled up and you're outside your vehicle pumping gas, that dog cannot get to you. So start practicing rolling a window like halfway down. And then at home, maybe you roll your window halfway down. You have your dog in the vehicle and you're like, come on, let's go, let's go, let's go. And you've got to kind of teach them how to jump out of the window with it rolled halfway down. And then when you're pumping gas, they're, you're probably going to stick their head out of the window. You kind of give them some pet. Oh yeah, good job, buddy. You're doing a great job. And, uh, and if I'm going to go inside, maybe I roll that window up a little bit. And then as soon as I walk back out, I roll the window back down, right? I want my dog to stay in the vehicle, but to know how to jump out of the vehicle if I need them to. And then if people come up to my vehicle, I want to start teaching the dog to bark and, and like watch over and protect the vehicle, right? So things that I'll do is, you know, we have a lot of guys around here that are panhandling and stuff like that. Now, if I'm going to help somebody out, I don't do this with them. I don't have the dog barking at them. But a lot of people, like, they're not right next to you. They're not near enough where you can do anything. So they're, like, over in a median or something, and you'll see your dog will be like, who is that? And they'll, like, they'll, like look at them. Their ears are up. They're focused on the person, right? And so I'll start doing that that um, suspicion exercise we talked about at the beginning. I start going, who is that, buddy? What are they doing? Keep an eye on them. Yeah, don't let them come close to our vehicle. What are they doing over there? And if they bark... <laughs> talking in that voice makes me a little feel like I have to cough. If they bark, I go, Oh, good watch. Yeah. Keep an eye on them, buddy. Keep an eye on them. And as they continue to bark, if they do, I praise with good watch and I kind of just continue to build the suspicion, right? So what this will do is anytime a person that your dog is unfamiliar with comes near your vehicle, they will start barking at them. 
Okay. And this is another thing that you can start integrating into your daily or weekly routines with your dogs is getting your dog used to watching over the vehicle, right? Sometimes you're in the vehicle, sometimes you're out of the vehicle. But when I tell my dog, you wait, they're to wait, they're to stay in the vehicle. But if somebody comes near the vehicle, they can still bark at them, right? Uh, another one is keeping an eye on your children. So now depending on um, your, your lifestyle and your situation and things like that, what we used to do is I had protection trained dogs. And uh, for a long time, I was in the military. So we lived in neighborhoods. We either lived in neighborhoods on base or we lived in neighborhoods off base. Even when we had a couple acres, it was like most of the, the land that you had was behind the house. So the houses were still fairly close together on the road. And whenever our kids would play outside, when they were really young, my ex-wife would be outside with them, right? But we would have the dogs out there laying in their place, watching over the kids. As the kids got a little older and they could, you know, be in the yard, but not necessarily always directly supervised, we would still have a dog out there with them. And, and until the dog earns its trust to not be tethered to something, we would tether it either to like, you know, sometimes you have those little pillars that hold up a little awning over the front door or things like that. And so we would tether it to something and we would let our kids know if a stranger comes up, you run to the dog. You run to Legolas or Eowyn, those were their names. And so you run over to the dog and if you're there next to the dog, nobody's going to mess with you because our dogs wouldn't let anybody get close to our kids. And so we, but you have to do those obedience exercises of being in the yard, laying in your place, not moving, people walking on the sidewalk, good, leave it, it's okay. As long as they didn't come into our yard, the dog wasn't to bark at them, right? But if they stepped into our yard and the dog barked, I'd be like, excuse me, please don't step into our yard. If you step into our yard, my dog's going to bark. And if you come near my kids, my dog's going to bite you. So stay on the sidewalk. The sidewalk's fine, but don't come into the yard, right? And, um, and so that was another drill that we would run. Now, it's very important with these things that you are consistent. So whatever it is that you expect, you expect it consistently every time, right? I want the dog to behave this way in this situation. And you give clear expectations for the dog, right? If I say leave it, that means leave it. No more barking, no more growling, no more aggression of any kind. If I say lay in your place, you will lay in your place, right? If I start creating the suspicion exercises and I want them to bark, when they bark, I praise them, right? And I do whatever these things is, I want the dog to behave, however I want the dog to behave, I consistently will expect that same behavior and I make sure that the expectations are very clear to the dog. So there's no questions uh, in terms of what, in their mind, in the dog's mind, what they're supposed to do. Now, so we've got this dog, that we've done some stability with, we've done some uh, suspicion drills with. The next step is your socialization and exposure. Now this is ideal you start this when the dog's really young, right? Like I've got a little female Malinois, uh, that's the one I mentioned that was from the Dutch Shepherd breeding that we did. And she's, uh, she's staying with us, she's gonna be one of my personal dogs. And so I take her, when we go to lunch, I take her to the restaurants. Right. I, I go around and I do stuff with her. I bring her out to class and I get her around the, the dogs of my other clients who are coming to class because she's not that familiar with them. Right. And the way our typical Saturday runs is we do two hours of bite work and then we do two hours of obedience class. And I have only a couple clients that come to my bite work class, but I have numerous clients that come to my obedience class. So a lot of times her name is ecstasy, this little Mally female. A lot of times ecstasy has done two hours of bite work or maybe an hour of bite work. And then she watched another hour of bite work, right? And then there's a 30 minute break between classes. And then we start obedience training and there's all these new dogs and new people and things coming out. And so this is a great time to socialize and expose her to new dogs, new people, right after she's been doing bite work. <clears throat> and she's expected, don't bark at people when they come on the field. If I tell you it's okay, leave it alone. It's okay leave it alone, right? You're not to be uh, acting out. You're not to be acting aggressive, but you're also not to be moving away, right? It's okay. These dogs are fine. These people are fine. They're allowed to be here right now. Just relax, right? Now you can start doing this in places like in, in most places. If you go to like a Lowe's or a Home Depot, they're very dog friendly. You can take your dogs there. You take your dogs to dog 
stores like Pet Stupid and things like that. That's what I call Pet Smart. I call them Pet Stupid. And um, or Petco or what, whatever these other companies are, like these big, like um, multi chain pet store companies, right? You can go there, but the thing you have to remember if you go there is a lot of people that shop at those places are idiots. And a lot of idiots bring their dogs to those places and have no expectation that their dogs are going to behave in a certain way. And some of them have very, very little control and they have big dogs and they're, they cannot contain them. But yet they think it's a smart idea to bring their dog to this place because oh, I guess it's okay. They said I could bring my dog. And so if you take your dog to those places, you have to be very, very aware of the other people around you. And you need to make sure you don't set your, yourself and your dog up for failure. Right. So normally, if I am going to go into one of these places, normally I don't take my dog out of the vehicle. They just stay in the vehicle. and I just go in and get what I need to come out. I uh, leave the vehicle running, by the way, in Florida. That's very important. Vehicles running. Air conditioners on. Dog hangs out in the vehicle while I go in and come back out. But if I do decide I'm going to take my dog into one of these places, I get out of the vehicle and I look around the parking lot. And I'm like, are there any idiots out here in the parking lot? Okay. No, it looks pretty good. Open the door, let the dog out of the vehicle. If there is somebody that's slightly questionable, I go, it's okay. Leave it alone before the dog ever walks around the vehicle and it can even see them, right? They're already being told, hey, relax. Everything's good. Leave it. And then if somebody looks like they're having trouble controlling their dog, I keep a good distance between them. I don't want some pit bull dragging their handle up to me. Some pit bulls are great and some are not great at all, right? So I'm like, stay away from me. You don't need to be close to me. Our dogs don't need to interact. You go get in your car. I'm going in and getting what I need to get. There, we don't need to interact here, right? But all of this is exposure, right? The first time your dog walks through a parking lot, dogs have no concept that vehicles follow rules. We follow rules on the road. We follow rules in a parking lot, right? We follow rules in the way that we park. We follow rules in the directions that we drive on certain uh, lanes in the parking lots and all that kind of stuff. And of course, not everybody follows the rules. Sometimes there's idiots, but for the most part, there's rules. And it takes the dogs a couple of exposures to seeing a moving vehicle, right? Because they're probably used to seeing your vehicle sit there in the driveway, but they're not usually sitting right beside it when it's moving. And so all of a sudden they're like, whoa, that big thing's moving, right? And it's coming towards us. What's going on? And so they don't know what to do when they see that. And so they're like, well, do I move? Do I bark at it? Like, what do I do? And you have to communicate to your dog. It's okay. Leave it alone. Walk with me. Right? So if a dog barks at a moving car, for instance, I'm going to go fooey that, leave it alone. And then I'm, so I'm going to tell them, don't do that. Right? I don't want you to do that thing you just did. But then I'm immediately going to tell them, what do I want you to do? Foos with me, which means walk at my side. So fooey that, leave it alone. Foos. It's okay. You foos with me. And then they're like, okay, so I'm supposed to walk beside you. And I got in trouble for barking at that thing. All right. And then after a couple of times of seeing vehicles, they'll be like, oh, yeah, yeah, I get it. Like they turn and then they just drive past us. Okay, no big deal. Right. If I see that there's an open parking lot or parking space and they might pull into there, I go, wait, seats, good seats. It's okay. Leave it alone. They pull in. The dog sees the car pull into the spot and stop. And I go, good seats. All right, let's go. And we walk around the back of the vehicle and we go on into the store, right? So all of that is exposure training. Socialization even itself is exposure, but it's what do we want to expose the dog to? Do we want to expose them to people? That's probably a good idea. Now, when I expose my dogs to people, I don't generally let people pet my dogs. I just want them in groups and crowds in places like stores and places like that, restaurants, right? I want to take them any place I can take them and I want them to see other people. Generally, I don't let the other people interact or pet my dog, right? If they ask to the pet, I say, oh, I'm sorry, they're working right now. And most people go, oh, okay, I'm so sorry. You know, they're really pretty or whatever. And they, they're they really obedient, blah, 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 whatever they say. Thank you so much. And then they move on, right? And so I want to expose my dog to lots of other people, uh, lots of other situations, and any type of stuff that I think they might you know, experience in their life that I want them to have a knowledge of before we get into a situation. Okay. The other one is obedience and training. So where most people go wrong in their stability is they tell the dog what they don't want them to do, but they don't tell the dog what they want them to do. So an example of this might be 
um, your dog's in the house and they pull a um, pillow off your couch and they're going to start chewing on the pillow, right? And you say, fooey that, leave it alone. Fooey for us is our, it means shame on you in German. It's uh, like a correction word, right? And so we'll say, fooey that, leave it. And, and they're kind of like, okay. And then they do something else I don't want them to do. And I go, fooey it, leave it. And they walk into the kitchen and they start messing with the trash can. And fooey it, leave it, right? And so I, a lot of people, their mistake is they're constantly telling the dog what they don't want them to do, but they're not telling the dog what they want them to do. So in my house, I might say something like, fooey that, go to your place and plutz. So place is wherever they're supposed to be in the house. And plutz means to lay down. So fooey, whatever they're doing that I don't like. So I, I do give the correction for doing the thing I don't want you to do. But then I tell you the thing I want you to do. Go to your place and plutz. So they know go to your place means move to the spot that we call place. Good place, plutz, lay down. And then once they're there, good place, good plutz, you wait. And I'll give them the, the wait command, right? And then they're just to stay there. So where most people start to get frustrated is they're telling their dog, no, 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 no. And the dog's going, well, maybe this, maybe this, maybe this, maybe this. And they're still saying, no, no, no. And then they get frustrated and they want to yell at the dog, right? Rather than saying, don't do that, do this. And it's very simple, but it's something that if you don't do consistently, you'll start getting a lot of frustrating things occur. And then creating a safe and controlled environment. So whenever you're doing stability, one of the things that happens when we do stability, with, especially with a new client, is the clients get very afraid that their dogs are going to bite me when they're not supposed to. And because the handler gets very afraid, the dog realizes their handler is afraid and they're like, okay, something's bothering my person. I got to figure out what it is. I bet it's that guy. And then they bite, right? Now, of course, I am wearing the sleeves and things like that. But one of the things I will tell my clients very frequently is I say, listen, was your dog biting me with these sleeves on? Yes, my dog was biting you with those sleeves on. Did I get injured? No, you didn't get injured. That's right. Because these sleeves are designed to protect me while we're doing the bite work with the dogs, right? Yes. Okay. So why are you afraid your dog's going to fail? This is a safe place to fail. In fact, it's good for your dog to fail a few times. So that they learn, oh, I'm not supposed to do that, right? I'm not supposed to bite this guy when my handler tells me leave it. And so I have the sleeves on. If they bite, number one, sometimes I come in and then I like flinch at the dog, right? And now this is a little bit more advanced, like medium level. It's not in the very beginning. I don't move like that. But as the dog kind of starts to get it, I'll, I, I start to push him a little harder, right? And so I might come in and I like come in and then I like jab at him, but I don't actually touch him. Or I'll come up high and I'll like swing my arm down low, but it'll come like to the side of their face, right? And, uh, and so when I do those movements, sometimes people correct their dogs. And I'm like, don't correct your dog because you see me move. It's okay to let the dog fail, bite my sleeve, go, hey, you're not supposed to do that. Fooey it that's better than I move, but the dog's doing what it's supposed to do. It's like, okay, like, like you're swinging your arm down. I might lean a little bit away from it, but I'm not going to bite it. Right. And the arm comes down right beside their face and the person corrects them. The dog's like, but I thought that's what I was supposed to do. Right. Why did I get a correction? I thought that's what I was supposed to do. The dog did good, but the person corrected anyway. So make sure you're not correcting the dog when it's doing what it's supposed to do. It's okay to take that like one second and process the information and make sure that it's a safe environment to fail in. And then we control our situations so that we can expose the dogs to various different things. But we're only, ideally, we only do one or two new things in each scenario, right? So sometimes people are like, okay, I want to do all these things. I want my dog to do these 12 things. And I go, great. We're going to focus on this one. And they're like, yeah, yeah, but I want to do all 12. I'm like, uh-huh, we'll get there, but you can't do 12 things at once. You have to get one. And then once you've got that one down, you add one more. And you get that one down and you add one more. And you keep going until all these things are normal and they're not new anymore. But if you try to introduce 12 new things all at once, you overwhelm both the handler and the dog, right? So the environment is controlled. In, in that we're, we're only focusing on this right now, whatever the this is. 
and it's safe so that if the dog fails, nobody's getting injured, right? And so when we have a new dog come on ground in our obedience classes, and maybe it's barked at other dogs in the past, right? And so I'll do a couple private lessons. I'll bring some of my dogs out and we'll, okay, the dog's now good with some other dogs at, at various different distances. We'll like slowly bring them together and stuff like that. And then, okay, you're good enough to start doing class now. But even then when they come to class and I start having dogs go beside dogs or dogs go past dogs or step over dogs and all the stuff that we do is this other dog in the beginning is just going to lay on a platform that's close, but not part of the loop that we're doing. And it's just going to watch the other dogs do what the other dogs are supposed to do. And it's going to see, oh, these people are going to move around. The dogs are going to move around. This stuff is happening. And I tell them that new handler, I say, all your dog is to do is to lay here and watch. And so if they bark, correct them. If they growl, correct them. They're to lay, they're not to move, and they're not to growl or bark at, at other people or dogs. And then once they do that, then we might move them onto a table a little closer, or we might put them on the table, but we have it set up where maybe the dogs jump off and go around that dog and back up on the other side, right? And then I'll get kind of close just in case something happens, and we'll be like, all right, here it comes. Like, dogs are going to start stepping over you. It's okay. You're doing a great job, buddy, right? But I make those environments as safe as possible so that we make sure if there's a failure, we start those failures in a way that other dogs and other people aren't going to get bit. And then we slowly move forward. Now, of course, there's small levels of risk in all of these, but we're trying to mitigate that risk as much as possible. And then, um, so healthy balance between protection training and regular activities. Here's the bottom line. Your dog needs to be stable. And 99.9% .9 of your life is not going to have anything to do with your dog biting. Right. Because the vast majority of your life, if you get attacked every day, you're doing something wrong in your life. If you get attacked every week or month or even once a year, unless you're like a bouncer or something, you're probably doing something wrong in your life. Right. The vast majority of us, like maybe you have a concealed weapons permit and you carry a concealed weapon. How many times have you had to use it to defend yourself? The vast majority of people, the answer is never. Right. Now, maybe you've trained with it, so you've used it. You're practicing carrying it, you practice drawing it, you practice shooting it, you practice all those things, right? But in terms of actually needing to use it for defending yourself against somebody attacking you, the vast majority of people is never. And it's the same for people who get a protection dog. Now, the benefit of having a protection dog is you're not concealing the protection dog, right? The dog is out there and people see that it's highly trained and they go, I don't want to mess with that person. Even if I'm looking for someone to mess with, I'm not messing with them. So it's a great deterrent. So the key things, if you have a protection dog, are your dog needs to be obedient all the time. All the time, your dog is obedient. How many times are they not obedient? And when I say not obedient, this means just running free in the yard, right? If they're running free in the yard, if I say, let's go, they better immediately come. If they don't, they, get, they don't get that freedom anymore. They don't get to run until they've proven themselves. Right. So maybe we'll do some stuff and then we'll we'll try it again. But the for me, once a dog has been trained for protection work, it is always 100 percent under obedience. And so anytime I give that dog a command and it doesn't obey that command, it loses whatever freedom it had. OK, so that's one. The other one is I want to take that dog with me as often as I can to as many places as I can so that they are getting the socialization and the exposure to situations. And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, these are normal. Like we come to these types of places all the time. Right. I used to take Ratchet to SHOT Show and all these events. And when we were there, he knew, hey, lots of people are going to pet on me today because I'm helping with networking. He didn't know it was called networking, but he knew, hey, we're going to come up and talk to this guy. And then after a few minutes talking to this guy, my person is going to tell me all right, go on. And he's going to pet me. This new guy that we just met is going to pet me. Right. And he loved it. He would go around and he would interact with these people. So he was always under obedient obedience. He was exposed and socialized with as many situations as possible. But when I would switch him on, somebody could literally be in the middle of petting him and I could say, take him out. And he would immediately start biting them and they could say it's over. And he would stop. I'd say out, leave it. Let's go. He'd stop. And then you look at me like, all right, can they pet me again? Right. And that's the kind of general idea you want to develop with your dog in your life as you're moving through and doing things. So I hope that that's been help helpful for how to balance protection training 
with everyday life. All right, so let's check and see if we have any comments to respond to. I haven't had too much stuff going on. Chip said, hybrid vigor, my new ex excuse when Loki gets noisy. That's right. Yeah, sometimes that uh, you can get that little bit of amped up energy level. And um, and we try and, and bring that back down. Uh, I'm trying to like remember Loki's exact uh, litter. I think he was in Athena litter. So that was a striker raven puppy, if I'm not mistaken. Um, it could have been a Punisher Athena litter. So let me know, Chip. I can't remember who the parents were. It was either uh, Punisher Athena, which that was a hybrid. That was a Malinois, that Shepherd Cross. Uh, or it was uh, Striker and Raven. Um, and then New Rula Darwish said, Hi, uh, I'm watching you from Afghanistan. That's awesome. Uh, I'm glad you're here. We are on, I don't know what time it is for you guys, because it's probably like 12 hours difference or something like that. Um, but Eastern, like New York City time. Uh, we are on at 5 p.m. every week uh, at this time. So we'd love to have you joining us regularly. I've got a couple of guys uh, in the Middle Eastern region that uh, follow us fairly regularly. So I'm glad to have you here. Uh, welcome. Let's see. It looks like we've had a few little comments. Some of these get really uh, commenty and some not quite so much. But it uh, looks like Daniel with Nitro said that's his favorite game, talking about the tug game. Uh, that is, yeah, a lot of dogs really like it. So make sure if you start doing tugs with your dogs, you also integrate this. So when I say out, that means stop biting, right? So I'll do a tug with the dog and I'll let them start tugging. And I'll be like, oh yeah, go get it, go get it. Yeah, get it, get it, boy. And like they're tugging and I'll like let them like thrash and pull back and all that kind of stuff, right? And then stop moving it, right? Because a lot of times when I'm playing, I'm moving, I'm lifting it up, I'm moving it side to side, right? And I'm kind of playing, if it if it's a soft like toy that I'm playing with with a young dog, I'm kind of shaking it back and forth, right? Stuff like that. So when I get ready to tell them leave it, I stop moving it and I go out, leave it. And then when they let go, if they don't let go, I have a lead on them, I give them a little correction, fooey that, out, leave it. Good, leave it. And they get lots of petting. Good, leave it. And I put it away for a couple minutes and I bring it back out and we play with it again. And uh, so what we're doing is we're, we're working the obedience into that fun game with the dog, right? And then when it comes to actually having your bite work, the dog knows, oh, when my person says out, that means I stop biting, right? Because you've already trained the condition that when you're biting and I say out, that means stop. And uh, so uh, that's a, just a little thing. If you're not already doing that, Daniel, I recommend you put that in there. Uh, his out is always perfect on the tug, not so much on the rugs. Yeah. So if, if puppies are chewing on things they're not supposed to chew on, um, I, I give them pretty decent little corrections for that. And, uh, you know, puppy level, uh, but it's still like, hey, knock that shit off. Cut it out. Quit chewing on my rugs. And, uh, and I may also make their place some, somewhere that's a little bit farther away from that kind of stuff so that they're not quite as tempted to, uh, to mess with that, um, mess with those and mess them up, especially if they're nice. All right. So I appreciate you guys being here. Um, I'm glad that you guys joined us. If you enjoyed this content and you'd like to support the work that we do, please give us a thumbs up uh, wherever you are watching us at. Subscribe. Tell your friends. If you're on YouTube, make sure you hit the uh, notification button so that you're uh, notified whenever we're getting ready to come on. Don't forget to follow us on Noster and Fountain.fm. Both of those platforms are value for value platforms. So if you like something that somebody's posting uh, or a podcast that they made, you can send them a little bit of value using uh, Bitcoin and Satoshis. It's pretty awesome. You can also earn Bitcoin and Satoshis on both those platforms uh, by getting things like zaps and boosts from other people. And on Fountain, you uh, earn a little bit of Bitcoin when you listen to podcasts. So if you listen to podcasts um, and uh, and it's on the Apple platform, uh, any, any podcast that's listed on the Apple platform is pulled into the Podcasting 2.0 platform and Fountain operates off the Podcasting 2.0 platform. And so if it's on Apple, it will be on Fountain. And if you listen to it on Fountain, you will earn like a sat a minute or sometimes it's a sat every five minutes. It depends on how the person has it set up. And um, and so it's not a lot, but it builds up over time if you listen to a lot of, of podcasts. And then you can start sharing that with people or you can just let it build up. And then if you decide, you know what, I'm not into this Bitcoin thing. I just want my 30 or 50 bucks that I've earned. Um, you just put it in a lightning wallet and have it converted to money and it goes into an account and you can move it around just like you can on Venmo or Cash App or anything else. So lots of cool stuff there. Check out Noster, N-O-S-T-R. 
and fountain.fm. Also, check out and share our websites, FortressK9.com and K9Academy.us. If you know people who need help training their dogs, turn them on to K9 Academy. If you know anybody who's interested in purchasing a dog, turn them on to Fortress K9. Uh, that would really help us out, and we appreciate it. Um, don't forget to follow us on almost all the platforms. We're on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Truth, Gab, MeWe. I'm probably going to stop posting on MeWe here pretty soon because um, I pay for MeWe, and they're like, you have used up all your space. And I'm like, yeah, I don't think I'm playing that game anymore. I'm not going to pay you to limit the space that I have uh, on MeWe. So we'll see. But we're also on Freesteading and, of course, Noster. So do all the things. Like us, share our stuff, comment, all that good stuff that gets the algorithms going and lets people know that they that people like our content. Um, don't forget to check out our two uh, franchises, at Canine Philosophy and at Mountain Vista Canine. They are both on Instagram and TikTok. And uh, Pat at Canine Philosophy uh, offers distance training with your dog via Zoom calls. Uh, he will also uh, sometimes do board and trains if he has the room and uh, is an all-around great guy. He also has a uh, Instagram channel called Uncensored Tactical, and uh, he does covert entry, lock picking, all that kind of cool stuff. So uh, you can check out both his accounts there. And then Brenda and Ed at Mountain Vista Canine are in Tennessee. I was saying North Carolina. Now I'm like, is it North Carolina or Tennessee? I'm guessing. Uh, I'm pretty sure they're in Tennessee. Uh, they're running a small breeding program using our lines. So if you are interested in a puppy and you're in that general area, uh, you might want to follow them. It is Mountain Vista, letter K, number nine on both Instagram and TikTok. So you can check them out. Next week, we're going to be talking about debunking myths, common misconceptions, about protection dogs. We're going to get into some of the techniques and, and training, and it's going to be a lot of what do we do different than a lot of other people. So uh, hopefully you guys will join us for that next week, 5 p.m. Eastern time on Thursday. And it looks like uh, we've gotten all of our content and comments addressed. So until next time, remember to train hard and stay safe. Fortress Canine Podcast.